starting to uh, accelerate at our house. Uh, she did tell me the other day that her, her hands are getting ready to open presents. <laughs> so we'll take a few uh, weeks and prepare. But, but today we are going to continue on in, in Romans where we left off. And, and if you remember last week, we talked about the we looked at and we talked about the absolute sovereignty of God and how it is His will that prevails even in salvation. We completed, then, if you remember, the first chord that is contained in Romans chapters 9, 10, and 11. And it is an admittedly hard chord in some ways to wrap our minds around. God is 100% completely sovereign over His creation and his purposes and plans will prevail. Now, some of you, as you've been thinking about this and, and thinking through it over the week, perhaps you've been tempted to simply just throw your hands in the air and cry out, what's the point then? Visions of mechanical robots and puppets on a string, they come to mind. But this is not an accurate portrayal of the Christian life, nor is it an accurate portrayal of God. If you remember, at the end of the message, I tipped my hand to the next chord that we're going to begin to look at. It's found beginning in today's passage and following. This morning, we're going to look at a new step in Paul's argument, and that is Israel's rejection lay not only in God's choice, as we've been looking at, but also in the nature of Israel's disobedience. You see, Israel pursued the law by works and not by faith. You see, Israel failed to believe. And with this in mind, then, I invite you to follow along as I read through today's passage found in Romans chapter 9, beginning in verse 30. And then following through Romans chapter 10, verse 13. Romans 9, 30 through 10, 13. And there we read this. What then shall we say? And in response to everything Paul has been talking about, what are we going to say about it? That the Gentiles who did not pursue righteousness have obtained it? A righteousness that is by faith? But Israel, who pursued a law of righteousness, has not attained it? Why not? Because they pursued it not by faith, but if it were by works, they stumbled over the stumbling stone. As it is written, see I lay in Zion a stone that causes men to stumble, and a rock that makes them fall, and the one who trusts in him will never be put to shame. Brothers, my heart's desire and prayer to God for the Israelites is that they may be saved. For I can testify about them that they are zealous for God. But their zeal is not based on knowledge, since they did not know the righteousness that comes from God and sought to establish their own. They did not submit to God's righteousness. Christ is the end of the law, so that there may be righteousness for everyone who believes. Moses describes it in this way, in the way the righteousness that is by the law, the man who does these things will live by them, but the righteousness that is by faith says, do not say in your heart, who will ascend into heaven, that is to bring Christ down, or who will descend into the deep, that is to bring Christ up from the dead. But what does it say? The word is near you. It is in your mouth and in your heart. That is the word of faith we are proclaiming. That if you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified, and it is with your mouth that you confess and are saved. As the scripture says, anyone who trusts in him will never be put to shame. For there is no difference between Jew and Gentile. The same Lord is Lord of all and richly blesses all who call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Let's pray this morning. Father in heaven, we thank you for this word. And as we've been working our way through Romans, we've come across some things that are difficult to understand in our own finite minds. But Holy Spirit, we pray that yet again you do that amazing work of opening our minds and our hearts to your word, that it may find fertile soil, making us more like you. 
And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, the term righteousness, it appears 11 times in the Greek New Testament and eight times actually in the NIV translation in these few verses. That's how many times the term righteousness shows up in these few verses. If ever there was a passage about righteousness, this is it. I mean, that word shows up a lot. But there are two ways outlined here about how to pursue righteousness. One is by works and the other by faith. And we got a slide for this one. It's always comforting when I look up and there's the top of the head. There's two ways that are outlined about how to pursue righteousness. One is by works and the other by faith. But there's only one that saves. There's only one that's good for salvation. How many of you remember this past World Series? Ah, okay, Brett's hand's going up nice and tall. I knew, I knew Brett would. It was a great series, and really it went down to the wire. In fact, there's a picture, I think, of we got, this Brett might like this. Let's go, to the, yeah, there we go. You liking that, Brett? Yeah, oh yeah, okay. <laughs> if you remember, the Giants won in seven games. And uh, they just happened to make a few more plays than the Kansas City Royals did. And that really determined the series. If you watched much of the series, I love baseball, so I was watching, I was into it. Not to mention, though, that the Giants rode the arm of Madison Bumgarner <laughs> through the whole series. But I remember as I was watching uh, the series during one game, and, and the commentators talked about how the Giants wanted to win more than Kansas City did that game. Really? I find that hard to believe. But you know, that's how we look at so many things, isn't it? The one who succeeds, well, they obviously wanted it more. They worked harder. There are many, many people that pursue righteousness one way or another. The Greenpeace activist, he's pursuing righteousness. The Hindu yoga expert, they're pursuing righteousness. The Muslim terrorist, pursuing righteousness. The Red Cross aid relief worker is pursuing righteousness. There are steps that they have been taught to make them a better person. The aid relief worker believes that by making a difference in another person's life, they have achieved some degree of righteousness. The terrorist believes that by carrying out Allah's judgment on the infidel, they are obtaining righteousness. If they want it more, well, they'll work harder at it. That's the American ideal. If you want something, work hard enough at it and it's yours. And if you don't succeed, well, you obviously didn't work hard enough. How many people have heard that in one way or another growing up? I believe there's even more hands than just went up. That's ingrained into our, our mindset. You see, that was exactly the Jewish problem. They had been working so hard at attaining righteousness, but it had done them no good. Also, it's why they had such a difficult time with the Gentiles obtaining righteousness. They hadn't earned it. What do you mean the non-Jewish people have righteousness now? That's not fair. They haven't done anything to earn it. When considering this, we must remember all the way back to the beginning of our time in Romans. In chapter 1, verse 17, we learned that righteousness is based on faith. It is a gift from God. Do you remember going through that a number of weeks ago? This is stuff good. <laughs> Glad to know you're paying attention. This is stuff that we've already learned. There is no way that we can work our way to heaven. It is impossible. We are sinful by nature, and our works are as filthy rags, as Isaiah says. But even within this, Paul does not object to obedience to the law. He's not saying obedience is a bad thing. What he objects to is the reason for the obedience. Chapter 10, verse 2 says that the Jews were zealous for God, 
Zeal is a word that comes to the English directly from the Greek. That's a Greek word. It's a transliteration. The lexical definition, if you're to look in my library, is an intense positive interest in something. The American Heritage Dictionary defines zeal as enthusiastic and diligent devotion. If somebody has zeal for something, they are enthusiastic about that thing. They are diligently devoted to that thing. But what is the problem with the Jews' zeal? Well, it's not based on knowledge, Paul says. The Jews were to, they were to be commended for their zeal. God was its object. That's a good thing. But it was flawed in that it's not God's way to salvation. It's the difference between a haircut and open heart surgery. You know, with a haircut, there's some room for error. I know that every time I get a haircut, it's not done to precision. They don't run a laser over my head and cut every hair exactly the way it's supposed to be. In fact, I am sure that if you were to precisely measure the length of every single hair after each cut, they would never line up exactly the same. But it doesn't matter. As long as it's close enough, it looks good, I think. Thankfully, the person who cuts my hair, I get it pretty close every time. But now open heart surgery? That's a whole different thing. We do not want just close. We want it exactly right. A little discrepancy is a matter of life or death. The Jews' approach to God's law, well, it was a matter of life and death as well. You see, instead of trusting God, the Jews took over. Instead of trusting God in His way, the Jewish people just took over. Verse 4 says that Christ is the end of the law so that there may be a righteousness for everyone who believes. This does not mean that Jesus came and put an end to the law in terms of making it void or no longer good, but rather Jesus came as the fulfillment of the law. He embodies everything about the law. He is the end as in the culmination of the law. And this is what Jesus, or why Jesus says what he does in Matthew chapter 5, verses 17 through 20. There we read this. Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. I tell you the truth, until heaven and earth disappear, not the smallest letter, not the least stroke of a pen, will by any means disappear from the law until everything is accomplished. Anyone who breaks one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever practices and teaches these commandments will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you that unless your righteousness surpasses that of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, you will certainly not enter the kingdom of heaven. The Jews wanted righteousness, but they wanted it on their own terms. You've got to understand this. The Jewish people, the nation of Israel, they wanted righteousness, but they wanted it on their terms. They had a devotion to God, but they were unwilling to follow what He commanded. How often do we find ourselves in the exact same boat? We may be willing to follow God when it's convenient. But what about when it's hard? We know that we're to share the gospel, for example, but I, I, I can't when I'm at work. It's against regulations. Or I can't with my neighbor because, well, I have to live next door to him every day. I don't want to ruin that relationship. I can't with my friends. They may think I'm sort of weird. I can't on Saturday morning. I mean, that's my time to sleep in. I mean, you get the picture. The same could be said for how we use our resources, our time, our money, our talents, you name it. We want a relationship with God, but we want it on our own terms. The problem with this is that by putting righteousness on their terms, the Jews stumbled. Verse 33 quotes 
Isaiah 8.14 and Isaiah 28.16. It's quoting those passages to show just how the Jews have stumbled. Peter talks about this also in his first letter, chapter 2, verses 6 and 7. The Jews were so busy working out their righteousness that they failed to look at where they were going. They took their eyes off the Lord and therefore they fell flat on their face. You understand what's happened? They are so consumed with working out their righteousness on their terms, the way they want it. They took their eyes off the Lord and they stumbled. They fell flat on their face. You know, I remember at one time riding bikes with my sister, who's three years younger when we were kids, and we decided to race home. We were all about a block or block and a half away from the house and race you home. Now, again, I'm three years older than she is, and, and normally I'd beat her. And I thought, you know what? I'm going to make it interesting today, and I'm going to let her have a little bit of a head start. So I let her, I said, you go ahead and get going. I'll, uh, I'll catch up to you, and I'll beat you. Well, we started out, and um, she thought for sure that she was going to beat me this time. And uh, she just might have, actually. She had a little bit of a head start. And so she decided to turn her head around and yell at me, Hey, I'm going to win this time. You're not going to catch me. And unfortunately for her, when she did that, she was no longer watching the road, and she ran, boom, right into a parked car. Now, being the good brother that I am, I made sure she was all right, only after I crossed the finish line and went back. <laughs> you know, works-based righteousness will lead to nothing but a big, horrific crash. And this was the problem for the Jews. Their eyes were on themselves and what they were doing rather than on the Lord. That's the problem with works-based righteousness. Your eyes are on yourself and what you're doing. All the works and the things you have to do instead of on God. Righteousness, being holy, being right with God, it's available for all who believe. It is based on faith and always has been, as we learned earlier in Romans. There is an accessibility of the gospel that is gained by faith, not by works. So in contrast to works-based righteousness, Paul talks about faith-based righteousness. We have learned and we see again that faith does not require heroic feats. There is a righteousness that is available for all who believe. It is that simple. There is a righteousness available for all who believe. It's, it's really that simple. This can be a point of contention for some people because they simply cannot believe that there's not more to it. What do you mean that's it? God has to require more. Well, in many ways, there was a whole lot more that was required, but Jesus took care of all of it. His death and resurrection completed all that was required, and all that we have to do is believe in faith. That's it. In verses 6 through 8, Paul strings together some quotes from Deuteronomy chapter 30. And I'm not going to get into all that today, but I know some of that argument can get a little convoluted. What do you mean going up and rising down? And Go back to Deuteronomy 30 and you'll see the quotes that he's stringing together there. This passage, it contains some of the last words of Moses to the Israelites. And Paul is telling the Israelites that keeping the commands is not some great feat of heroism but that it is possible because the word is right here, right here in us. It is a matter of trusting God, not working harder. And Paul applies these verses then to show how it works in conjunction with faith. Scripture says that it is a matter of believing in your hearts that Christ raised and confessing that Jesus is Lord. It further says that anyone who calls on the Lord, not may be saved, 
Not perhaps will be saved, but what? Will be saved or shall be saved. It's a, it's a done deal. Understand then that salvation involves inward belief and outward confession. Salvation involves, through faith, inward belief and outward confession. That's salvation. Now, there are a couple of points to make about this. First is the use of the word heart. Biblically, the heart is not only the seat of the emotions and affections, like we like to think about in modern America, oh, I love you with all my heart, baby, and it's just, you know, I just am feeling it, you know? But it also incorporates the intellect and the will. In other words, it's a full-orbed, holistic belief. It affects every aspect of who we are. We intellectually assent. It permeates our entire being. Too often we try to divorce the intellect from our emotions. That's the American way, but it's not possible with salvation. The righteousness of God, then, is an active force to which we humbly and obediently subordinate our entire selves. Not just when it makes us feel all tingly. Now, we need not press confession too far. We really get into confession, praying the prayer. Confession, what confession is, is it's the outward manifestation of a critical inner response. You know, too often we push and push and push and strive to get someone to pray the prayer, to repeat the prayer, like it's some kind of magical incantation. Someone may regurgitate some words, but that does not necessarily mean a change of heart. Using heart in a biblical sense. You know, I have known people who have prayed the prayer, the sinner's prayer, just to get someone off their back. Leave me alone. Fine, I'll pray the prayer. Just don't bother me anymore. I've known people that have, quote, prayed the prayer to simply get someone to quit shoving the gospel down their throat. However, when someone has been absolutely changed, confession will follow. It simply makes sense. We see this throughout the gospel accounts. People, they come to a greater understanding of who Jesus is, and they respond with confession. For example, when Jesus gets into the boat after walking on the water, the disciples respond with worship, and they proclaim, truly, you are the Son of God. That's just one example. They had an amazing encounter with Jesus, and it results in confession. Proclaiming Jesus is God. Understand within this, then, there are two points to which we hold and are necessary for salvation. And the first is this. Jesus is Lord. Jesus is Lord. This is a clear proclamation of deity. Jesus is God incarnate, God in the flesh. In the person of Jesus, God made a personal visit to humanity. We see this in Peter's confession as the very Son of God. In order to be saved, you must hold to Jesus as the very Son of God. He is completely God and the only one through which sin can be conquered. There is no other name under heaven by which men can be saved. Don't stumble over Jesus. God knew that we needed a Savior. And so He came and He provided one. Now the second thing that we see is that God raised Jesus from the dead. That's the second point. Jesus is Lord, and God raised Jesus from the dead. Jesus conquered death through his resurrection. Now, that presupposes his death. If Jesus hadn't died, then there would be no resurrection. Through his death, Jesus paid the penalty for our sins, and through his resurrection, he conquered that penalty and paved the way for us to have eternal life with God. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through Him. I know that it is simply fantastic. It goes against our sensibilities. But it is truth. 
do not stumble over Jesus by failing to believe the mystery and fantastic love of God for you. Like the centurion, we cry out, I do believe. Now help my unbelief. I do believe you're the Savior. Now help me to understand it all. So how in the world does this all fit in with chapter 9 and God's sovereignty and election? Because Paul says, what then shall we say? This is flowing exactly out of everything he said in chapter 9, dealing with God's sovereignty and election. What is Paul getting at? What does this have to do with anything? Well, what Paul is saying is that God chooses, but we must respond. That's really tipping off the next chord. God chooses, but we must respond. There is a decision to make. We must believe. And I know that this seems to contradict what it was that we learned over the last few weeks. God chooses. God calls. It's His free will. He chooses whom He wants. Not in accordance with anything we do. But now I have to act by believing? Yes. Yes. Well, that makes no sense. Remember, we talked about how God places a call on a person's life. This call is God-initiated, and it allows that person to say yes to Him. Without that call, they cannot say yes. It's impossible. But even within that, there is a moment of belief when we must say yes to God. Yes to Jesus as Savior. We have to accept Jesus as our Savior and the only way to relationship with God and eternal life. Not by doing things. And that's what's meant by verse 13, which is a quotation of Joel chapter 2, verse 32. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. You call on the name of the Lord, you will be saved. Can you call on the name of the Lord without God doing some kind of calling on you first? Well, no, we learned that in chapter 9. How does that all fit together? Well, the best way to think about this is that salvation does not run on a monorail, this side of heaven. You, you, I know it's hard to grasp intellectually. I know that. And in the end, we are left with the only proper response, which is to worship the Lord. But the great preacher, Charles Spurgeon, he has an illustration that I think helps us to capture this. He talks about how salvation runs on a railroad track. There's one track that is God's sovereignty and election. And the other track, which is human responsibility to say yes to salvation. Both of these tracks are necessary for the train of salvation to run. They run seemingly parallel to each other and they look like they never intersect no matter how far down the track we look. We, however, can't see far enough down the road to where they actually do meet in heaven and become a monorail. That makes complete sense logically. Salvation, this side of heaven is not a monorail. Both tracks, God's sovereignty and election and human responsibility to say yes to the salvation call, they work together to propel the train of salvation down the track. Now, perhaps some of you have felt the call of the Lord on your life you know it beyond a shadow of a doubt. You know God is calling you unto salvation. You believe in your heart, meaning that you know it intellectually. Your will is submitted to it. It has affected your emotions that Jesus is the Son of God and that He died and rose again so that you may be forgiven of your sins and have eternal life with God, not some point in the future when you die, but today, now, and for eternity. You truly own all of that. But you've never confessed it with your mouth. 
Today is the day to do that. This morning, as we sing one last song, if that's you, if I've just described you, the gospel call, God's calling, He's knocking on the door. He's ringing the the doorbell. He's calling you. But all you've done is let it go to voicemail over and over and over. If that's you, pick up the phone today. During this last song, I simply just invite you to come forward in public proclamation, in confession, that you have given your life to Jesus as Lord, and you will be saved. You will be prayed with by one of our elders. We've got elders all over the place. Guys, if someone comes up here, come on up and pray with them. Today's the day. Don't put it off any longer. Do not stumble over Jesus today. Let's pray. Father in heaven, I just thank you so much for the salvation call that's placed upon the life Of those that you choose and how that works, we don't know completely. We've been talking about that. But we also know that we have to respond. We have to say yes. And Holy Spirit, I I am convinced there are some people here today that they know you've been calling. They know it. But they haven't responded. Holy Spirit, work on their heart and their mind today. Put aside fear. Put aside trepidation. Put aside feeling like maybe uh, uh, that would be silly. And spur them to simply come on up and confess you today in front of a body of believers that love each other. Lord, if there's someone here that's known you forever and they brought someone and they know that you're calling them, they both know it. Maybe they take the initiative and say, hey, I'll walk on up there with you. Lord, we just pray right now that those who know you've been calling would say yes and confess this morning. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. I invite the praise team to come up. And while we're singing, we're going to stand. We're going to sing a song about the fact that salvation is here. And and like I said, if you want to confess Jesus today, you want to confess him as Lord, just come right up here. Our elders, they're good guys. They'll come and pray with you. We'll introduce you to Jesus.